this thing here, I mean, it looks like a galaxy, right? It's like this weird, ghostly, dusty galaxy, but it's not a galaxy. It's a star in our own Milky Way that's about 1,000 light years away. And look at it. Like, that's not a star. Like, what on Earth is going on here? So it's something called LL Pegasi, or AFGL3068, if you prefer, uh, and it looks like this. Um, and I remember the first time that someone showed me this picture, and I was like, no way, that's fake, that's not real, that's like photoshopped, right? And they're like, no, 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 NASA press release, this is a real thing that they observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. And I was gobsmacked, like, it's really strange. So ignore, like, the bright star in the foreground, because that's just a bright star, so that's about, sort of, a couple of hundred light years closer to us. So this thing is really weird, like, no question about that, like, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So what it is is what's called a carbon star, so if you take a spectra of the light from that area of the sky, you will see there's a lot of absorption from carbon. In fact, it's absorbing all of the light from the star that's in the very center of that spiral so that we can't actually see it in the visible. And so we've seen a lot of these things before across the Milky Way. Basically, they're kind of like the last gasp at the end of a star's life. So we're talking about stars that are about the same size or mass as the sun. So huge massive stars that are like sort of 50 to 100 times the mass of the sun, when they get to the end of their life, they have this dramatic explosion that we call a supernova. But something like the sun, it kind of goes through this weird period where it sort of tries really hard not to just collapse and die. So the way that stars power themselves is through nuclear fusion, right? So they take a hydrogen atom, a single atom of hydrogen, fuse it together with another atom of hydrogen, and you make helium. And you need really intense temperatures and pressures to be able to do that. So in a star itself, you've got gravity constantly pulling it in and trying to collapse it. And then you've got the energy being released from that fusion, pushing it outwards all the time. But the only place that's actually dense enough or hot enough to be able to get those hydrogen atoms to come together and fuse together is in the very, very core of the star. So over the millions and millions of years that it lives for, you're constantly turning hydrogen into helium, but that helium's building up like a waste product. And eventually, you know, you get to the point where in the core, you've got no hydrogen left in that area where it's hot enough and dense enough to fuse it together. You've actually got no hydrogen left altogether. Then it's not producing any energy. It's not producing energy to stop gravity from collapsing it inwards anymore. And so it has this sort of like moment where gravity starts to collapse it, but then, oh, all of a sudden, it's hot enough in a very tight shell around that core to start burning hydrogen into helium again. And so what you end up with is this sort of like pulsation where it sort of collapses in and oh, it's hot enough again for a while until it expand again and then it'll collapse inwards again. And so you end up with these sort of slowly, these building up these shells of, of helium further and further out into the star until the point where you then have to start burning helium into the heavier elements. Like it gets hot enough to do that in those regions and you end up with this sort of onion-like structure of more and more elements being made around the core. By that point, though, you're producing so much energy that actually the star swells up to a huge size. So this is going to happen to the sun, and when it swells, it's actually going to go beyond, like, the orbit of Earth. You end up with this huge, huge star that at the edge, it's not really holding on to its gases very well anymore, and it can start to shed a lot of material as it sort of does this weird pulsing as it's producing these shells of material. But carbon stars, we've seen a lot of them across the Milky Way, all the things that are about the times the mass of the sun, which there are a lot of, tend to end their life as carbon stars, throwing off material in these sort of shells, though. So when you're throwing off all this carbon from the star, you end up blocking the light from the star, but you can still reflect other starlight off all that gas and dust that the star has thrown off, and you end up with what's called like a reflection nebula. So we know a lot of different reflection nebulae in our own sky. So what we kind of have here with LL Pegasi is like a reflection nebula, except it's not shells of material like we're used to, it's this weird spiral. So what is going on? So actually this spiral structure is actually what's called a perfect Archimedes spiral. Like literally if you overlay a perfect Archimedes spiral on this thing you'll see that it fits so so well. And I said at the beginning you know this thing could kind of look like a galaxy right, like a spiral galaxy, except a spiral galaxy is what's called a logarithmic spiral. 
so a logarithmic spiral that people will be most familiar with, you know, in nature we see it all the time, so like shells, like hurricanes and cyclones, galaxies, all logarithmic spirals. What happens is if you're going to draw it, the distance between the sort of ever winding spirals is getting bigger and bigger every time. So you're moving around at the same angle, but you're actually getting further and further away from every single um, spiral that you do. That's very different to an Archimedes spiral, where you're spiraling around at the same angle all the time, but actually what you're doing is you're keeping the exact same separation. You're moving away from the center at a constant speed, basically. And so what you've got here in LL Pegasi is clearly this case where you've got this material being shed off this central star, but instead of getting it in shells, you're getting it in this sort of constant rate of outflow from the star, but like in a spiral shape. Now, back in 99, Mastrodomus and Morris actually predicted that you would get that pattern if the star that's throwing off all that material wasn't just a single stationary star, it was actually in a binary system of stars. So there was two stars, and they're going round this sort of centre of mass between them. You don't have one thing that's going around one star, like in a planetary system, you know, with Earth around the sun, you have two stars, and they're both orbiting around each other. So the star that's giving off all of that carbon material is no longer stationary. It's moving, kind of like a, like a gardener sprinkler system or something, right? It's like constantly firing it off around the star. And then also this one is sort of gravitationally shepherding that material as well into this perfect spiral. So that's the hypothesis. Proving that that is true and it becoming accepted theory is the difficult part. So first of all, you have got to prove that this thing is a binary star system, right? And we've already said that we can't see it because all of this carbon material is blocking the visible light from the stars. But the way that we see through all this dust in the rest of the universe is through infrared light. And so back in 2006, when this image was first taken, um, they made sure to check with an infrared telescope. This was Keck in Hawaii on Mauna Kea. And they looked at this um, star with infrared light and actually found, yeah, there are two stars there. And actually in different infrared filters, you see different uh, the different stars. And so in a redder infrared filter, you see like just the one carbon star that's very red. In a middling one, you see both of the stars and in a very bluish sort of shorter wavelength infrared light, you see just the one star that's sort of its companion star. Okay, so that's first job down, proving that it's a binary star. Okay, yes, there are two stars that we can see uh, in the center of that spiral. So we reckon that around about 40 to 50% of stars are actually binary stars. Like, so that means when you look up in the night sky and you can see a single star, like, and you think that's one star, it's more likely that it's gonna be a binary star because we're at about 50%. In fact, one of the stars in the plow or the Big Dipper is actually a binary star. And if you get binoculars on it, you will be able to see that as well. So they're not uncommon things these binary stars. So we proved that there's a binary star there, but how do we actually test this hypothesis? Well, under the hypothesis, right, if you've got these two stars going around each other, then the time it takes for them to go around each other should be proportional to time it takes for the spiral pattern to move away. So imagine if you're stood in a single place watching these stars go around each other. If it takes, say, 10 minutes for them to go around each other, it won't, but say, let's say it does. Like every 10 minutes, you will sort of be hit by a fresh wave of carbon coming off one of the stars, right? And so that will be the spacing of the spirals. So if the spacing of those spirals is proportional to the period of those stars going around each other, then we can kind of be sure that it's because of the binary star system that this spiral has been created. So you've got to measure both of those things, right? So this is what the paper in 2006 that first sort of presented this image uh, that had been taken and was like, hey, look at this really cool weird thing. Um, this is what they tried to do. So the easy one there is to measure like the time between those successive spiral turns. So because we know how big the whole thing is, you can then get an estimate of the, the distance between each successive spiral turn. And then because we know how fast the material is outflowing in the spiral just through, you know, like taking a spectra and getting a redshift, we can then work out just from, you know, time equals distance over speed, what is the time difference between each successive spiral term? So this publication from 2006, when they first published this picture, said it was around about 710 years. Ooh, pretty short on astronomical timescales, right? Especially when this phase of carbon stars thought to be around about like 100,000 years to like a million years. So it's pretty short. So then the next thing you have to do is then figure out if that 710 years coincides with how long it takes for each of those two stars to go around each other. What is the orbital period of that binary star system? 
So that's a little bit harder. You can get it from sort of the distance they're separated. So that image that they took in infrared, they can estimate a separation. Again, from knowing how big that appears in the sky, knowing how distant they are, you can then estimate the actual distance separation of the stars. Then once you've got that, if you make the assumption that both of the stars are the same mass, which is quite a generalizing assumption, but if you do that, you can just use Kepler orbital dynamics to be able to get an estimate for the period. And so the authors of the study that produced this picture found that that period was around about 810 years divided by the square root of the mass of the star. So if each star has mass m, it's 810 over square root of m years. And so if you want to get 710 years, which is the, the spacing between the spiral turns, you need a mass of about 1.3 times the mass of the sun which is kind of the mass you would expect for a carbon star. Like it falls in that range. So from that result, it's becoming quite likely that this hypothesis is true. It's not quite accepted theory yet because there's still two weird things here about this. The first one is why haven't we seen more of these things? If 50% of stars are in binary systems and you know around about the mass of the sun stars are pretty common, like we should see quite a lot of these things. I mean, it could just be to do with the fact that the lifetime of a carbon star is pretty short in comparison to the lifetime of the main star. So when it's happily burning fusion, you know, the star could live like eight to 10 billion years, but the carbon star phase is more like 100,000 to a million years. So it's not a very large percentage of its lifetime. The other thing could also be to do with the fact that we'd have to see these things like purely face on, like with the two stars going around each other like this to get that spiral structure. That's kind of all to do with orientation. You're not gonna see all binary stars perfectly face on. Some of them are gonna be moving around this way, you know, slightly inclined. It's all to do with your viewing angle from Earth. So combined with the fact that the lifetime is short and that you have to be at the perfect viewing angle, maybe that's why we don't see many of these things. The second thing though is that we can even see it at all. Like the light from those two stars in the center is completely blocked by all the carbon dust that it's giving off. So it looks like that really bright star in the image is what's allowing us to see this thing. But actually that star is in the foreground. Like it's a lot closer to us than the thousand light years away that the spiral is. So what light source is actually producing the light so that it's reflected back at us so that we can see this carbon dust? And the authors of the paper that published this image actually suggested that if you look at the direction the light is coming from, it turns out that that's where the sort of galactic plane of the Milky Way is. So this thing is actually sort of raised above the main sort of spiral disk of the Milky Way. And if you look at the direction the light's coming from, that disk is in that direction. And so what they think it is, and the reason that it is so faint is because there's no main star nearby it to light it up, but actually it's being lit up by the entire sort of cumulative starlight of the Milky Way. It's sort of lit up by this sort of galactic glow. So it's a privilege we can even see this thing. Combine the fact that carbon stars have short lifetimes, that it's at just the right orientation for us to see this thing, and the fact that Hubble can just see it because it's so faint, because all it's reflecting is like galactic starlight. It's incredible. It really makes me wonder, like, what weird, wonderful objects do we not know about because we're not in the right place in the universe like to even be able to see them. Hey, curious minds. Oh, hit my microphone. Great start, thanks. Speed equals distance over time, so time equals distance over speed. Okay. What is the difference in time between each successive spiral turn? Term, turn.